good morning. It's good to see you here coming in uh, on Facebook Live and also on YouTube. And we appreciate you coming in and we appreciate any comments that you have, prayer requests, whatever you'd like to send to us. Our mailing address is Box 69, Vance, South Carolina, 29163. We're located at 1910 Camden Road in Holly Hill, South Carolina, 29059. And our email address is CorinthChurch1868 at gmail.com and CorinthBaptistChurch.org is our website, so you can check us out there. And uh, so if you want to find out things that are going on. And so as we uh, begin today, we're looking at the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, and that is to support missionaries who are work working in North America in different places. Wanted to highlight, now in each of your views, you have uh, the week of prayer brochure. So we're going to be highlighting one of these each day, not each day, well, yeah, each day, but each Sunday also. And so on day one is Shaheed Marufa Kamal, and they're working in Vancouver, British Columbia. And they're working with uh, different people there, and they have complex situations dealing with the Hindus and the Sikhs. So they have to be aware of what they believe and how they work. And so basically he says our prayer ministry is one of the successful connecting points. Many came to our church for the very first time for prayer. They have specific prayer requests and praise God. God answered them and showed them that He is a living God. And so they're basing this ministry on prayer ministry. So people just come to pray and ask for people to pray for them. And so let's pray now. We already have, I think, $400 toward our goal of $1,200 for the uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering. $800 of that will go to... Uh, Rose and uh, Nehemiah Cole, who are in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, 400 of that, and 800 of that will go to the North American Mission Board uh, to help the other missionaries in different places. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for missions. And Father, we thank you so much that we can support missions, that you would continue to work in that way, and thank you that we can support them through prayer and through giving. And we appreciate you so much in allowing us that privilege. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, Marcia, come. Call the worship. What has become our march called worship, the family of God, would you stand as we sing twice through? Mm -hmm.
and that's what happens. It's a part of life that we all got. And so, what I have here, though, is um, how many of y'all have had Christmas wreaths, but not in March? Okay, not in March. And some people leave them up. All right, but this is like an Easter wreath, and this talks about the life of Jesus. And we see Jesus when he came to Jerusalem. He had everybody was all excited, and then and he prayed, and then he came to Jerusalem, and then he was <clears throat> he was crucified on the cross, but then he rose again from the tomb on the third day, and gives us that hope that we can have, even though we die, if we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then one day that we will be united with Him and with all those people who also believe in Jesus and trust Him as their Lord and Savior. So we're in that time now where we're coming toward Easter, which is April 4, and that's what we're going to celebrate is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, Robin, I want you to have this. You can get this after church today, okay? All right, get it now. Come on, I'll give it to you now. There you go. So, Marshall, you come. Our worship hymn, hymn number 493, in the first and fourth verses of Longer Christian Soldiers, which is saying this. God was always being. 
always is and always will be. But Satan, Lucifer, as we knew him then, what is a created being? In Job chapter 38, verses 6 and 7, it says what uh, God was asking Job some questions, and he was asking about the creation at this point. He said, what supports its foundations? Talking about creation in heaven and earth. Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And the sons of God shouting for joy are the angels who are created. Lucifer, all the angels are created beings. That is important. You have to remember that. Now, he appears as an angel of light in Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He said in the second letter, 2 Corinthians, he said, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And so he will come on. Now, when you think of the word devil, what, what, what comes into your mind? What's the picture that comes that we've seen him portrayed as? Red, horns, tail, pitchfork, right? Now, what if you saw something like that coming at you? What would you do? Hey, how you doing? I don't think so. I think you'd be going the opposite direction from where that thing is coming from. But he also, he comes as an angel of light. And so when it's, oh, that looks pretty, that looks wonderful. And, you know, you want to go to, you know, what's the saying? They, they tell the moths, don't go to the light. But, you know, people say, don't go to the light because he appears as an angel of light. Then, he also fell from heaven. Now, he was created, highest angel. And he was created that way. He was there, but you can see in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, he starts coveting. Lucifer wants basically to take God's seat. He wants to be God. He can't be God, but he wants to take God's place. And, he, and if you see it in Isaiah 14, you see a bunch of sentences. I will, I will, I will, I will. Basically, it was his ego. He wanted to be God, but he couldn't. And because of that rebellion, he basically was told, you're gone. You're out of here. And he fell from heaven. And there were angels that also chose to follow him. And so they also fell too. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus was taught, they were talking about some different things. And Jesus said, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. That's how fast he went. In Revelation 12, 9, it's talking about, so the great dragon was thrown out. There's another name for Satan, the great dragon. The ancient serpent, another name who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world, he was thrown to earth and his angels with him. And then in Jude verse 6, and the angels who did not keep their own position, but abandoned their proper dwelling, basically they chose to rebel with Lucifer, follow him. He has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. And so these angels chose to follow Lucifer who wanted to be God and they were thrown out of heaven. And then in 2 Peter he talks about it for God didn't spare the angels who sinned but threw them out, threw them into hell and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment. And so these angels that rebelled against God are facing judgment. Some of them in jail chained up until that time. But Jesus, He helps us do it. Now, we've got to know our enemy, right? I mean, you guys who have been in the military, what do you do? You study the enemy. We, you know, we have surveillance. We have different things going on. We want to know what our enemy is doing, what the enemy is thinking, so that we can outthink them and outmaneuver them, so that we can have victory over them. So we need to remember, Satan, as a created being, we need to know what he does and how he thinks. Basically, Jesus, when he was discussing one day with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he told them, now this is how you win friends and influence people. He said, you are of your father the devil. Now you know that everybody just loved him when he made that statement. You know, how would you feel? Hey, your dad's the devil, man. How would you feel if somebody told you that? They have fighting words, right? Just shake your head. Okay, thank you. He said... You are the father of the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. And this is, he describes Satan's character. 
He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature, because he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan cannot tell the truth, because he is the father of lies. It might sound like the truth, it may have some truth mixed in, but it's a lie. You know, someone said, if you tell nine-tenths of a truth and one-tenth of a lie, what do you get? You get a lie. That's right. And so, that's where Satan is. Now, Peter describes Satan also as an adversary, as a lion, going about seeking whom he can eat or devour. Now, we've had personal experience with that. In Tanzania, we know how the lions work. And when they're hungry, they're going to go after their food and nothing's going to stop them. And Peter is saying, Satan is like a lion going after a kill. He wants to eat. So Satan wants to come after us. Satan also, he's no friend of ours. In Revelation 12.10, he says he accuses the brethren. Have y'all ever been accused of something? Falsely or truthfully? Just say yes. <laughs> yes. But, you know, yes, you had, uh, did you do that? And what was you? No, I did. Or yes, I did. You go with it. But then in Revelation 12, 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. Satan, not only is he the father of lies, but he is accusing believers day and night in front of the Father. Did you see that? Did you see what they did? They're not really believers. Look what they did. Look, did you hear what they said? Do you see where they went? Do you see what they're watching? Do you see what, hear what they're listening to? He's standing there accusing all the time, all the time, all the time. Look how bad they are. But if we are in Jesus Christ, if our faith and trust is in Him, Jesus steps up as our defense attorney. He's, because Satan has the prosecutors trying to you know, take us down. Jesus says, hey, those, that person belongs to me. They put their faith and trust in me. Yeah, those things are happening, but their sins are covered. They're taken care of. That's it. And so, Jesus also described Satan. He said, he is like a false shepherd. All he wants to do is steal and kill and destroy. That's all he wants to do. That is his mission in his life. To steal, kill, and to destroy. Anything that God has created, anything that God has done, Satan wants to corrupt it. Remember Paul writing, I think it's in Romans chapter 2, he talks about, the whole creation groans under the weight of sin. God created everything. There was no sin. Garden, Adam and Eve in the garden, they disobeyed and then sin came into the picture and it affected the entire creation. It was perfect before that time. But then sin came in through disobedience. And so Satan, whatever God has set aside, whatever God has done, he wants to corrupt it, he wants to pervert it, he wants to take it and use it for himself. And how many of y'all don't use the internet? In some way, shape, or form. Okay. The internet's a good thing for communication, education, things of this nature, but Satan has used it for his own advantages also because unfortunately there's things on there that are available that you have no business, that has no business being available, but it is. And so you have to learn to stay away from those things. You know, some of the terminology I've learned recently, not just yesterday, but in recent times, any of y'all heard of the dark web? Oh, yeah. Where it's a, it's a place that you just don't, you got to know how to get there. And it's a dark web where lots of things happen that aren't good. And it's, you know, it's a place where people go, they don't want to be out in the open, so they go on the dark web to hide what they're doing. So, the internet can be a good thing, but Satan is also using it for himself. You just name it, Satan is using it. Books are a good thing, right? You know, read, education, but there are books that he has used, Satan has used, that aren't good. 
that are corrupting different people in different ways. But we have to realize, Satan is a created being. But some people kind of dismiss it. Now, you've seen the, the cartoons, right? Now, you've seen some of the cartoons where you have the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. And the person, you know, they're talking and trying to, you know, don't do that. Oh, yeah, go ahead and do that. That'll be good. Don't, no, 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 no. And then, you know, some of the cartoons takes the angel, just be quiet. I want to do this. But you have to remember, Satan, in his position, he is a high dignitary person. He was the top angel before he was thrown down. He is now the commander-in-chief of the evil in this world. And we, have to, we can't just take him lightly. We, you should not do that. Because he shouldn't be taken lightly. You shouldn't dishonor or be frivolous with him. Because he is a lethal enemy that only wants, as remember what Jesus said, to kill, kill to steal, and to destroy. And so we have to be aware of that. He, and basically, he influences people. He tempts them. He doesn't make people do something, but he tempts them to do things. And then people make the choice whether or not to follow through. Now, he's also called the prince of this world. Y'all, Any of y'all know any royalty? Personally? Any of y'all met royalty? Personally? We sat Pam and I sat close to royalty before. So we haven't met him. But anyway, he's called the prince of this world or the prince of the power of the air. And basically, it's not that he is lawfully the prince, but he is a prince of this world in rebellion against God. And so he's known as the chief rebel against him in this world. But basically, he's already been judged, condemned, sentenced. He's not to be submitted to. But we are to renounce him because of his lawlessness as a criminal. He ought to be dethroned as a usurper and conquered as a rebel. And he's already been done that way through the cross of Jesus Christ. Now he is our adversary. He comes against us every single day. And we have to be aware of him and what he does. That's why we need to know our enemy. He is the adversary. If we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, he hates us. He hates us with a passion because we are believers. And also, He's the reality, the source of evil to others. He is the evil one, the source. Basically, He's the source and inspiration of evil in different people. And most of all, He is the enemy of Jesus Christ. Most of all, He hates Jesus Christ because of who He is, who he is Jesus, who Jesus is, and what He has done for us. He hates him. He hates him. And so, basically, they're diametrically opposed. But Jesus defeated Satan. That was the greatest defeat, is when Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. The thing that Satan had over everybody was death, and the fear of death and eternal punishment. But Jesus, when he died on the cross, he basically put us back into a point where we could have that broken relationship the relationship we have with God broken by sin, He put it to a place where we can be reconciled, brought back into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And Satan hates that. He hates that because he's been defeated in that way. And then when Jesus was buried, well, Satan thought he had him down for the count. But then what, ha what happened on the third day? He rose from the dead. Basically, he broke the chains of death. That was the biggest weapon that Satan had against mankind was death, mortality. But now, through Jesus Christ, if we know him as our Lord and Savior, what does Jesus promise us? Salvation, restored to the relationship, but also eternal life with him. And Satan cannot stand it. The thing is, we cannot be ignorant of or deny the existence of Satan. If you do that, that's going to be not good. Basically, it's going to be fatal results for you if you just dismiss it. Some people, if you ask them, you, you know, have you ever heard of this being called Satan, the devil, Lucifer? Nah, that's just a figment of somebody's imagination. Nah, that's not real. That's just, you know, some fairy tale. That's just some story. 
And when you come to that point, he's already got you. Because if you don't believe he even exists, he's got you. God's master, the great masterpiece that Satan does, he wants to destroy faith in his existence. If he can get people to believe he doesn't exist, that's one of his greatest masterpieces. Because then he can work unhindered if people don't even believe he exists. What does he do? He advances. You have to be, you should not be ignorant of his ways. You have to know what he's doing. And basically, if you ignore it, there's certain death and defeat. So you have to be aware of who he is and what he's doing. To escape, basically, you need strong faith to escape. You have to believe he exists. You have to have intimate knowledge of his ways and the resources and the things that he uses in this warfare that we are engaged in. Now, one of the things that he uses with us is temptation. Any of y'all ever been tempted? Any of y'all tempted to leave? <laughs> You've been tempted. Now, temptation, as we've said before, is not a sin. It's when you give in to it. But Satan is there. All he's doing is making sin. He's, making, he's giving you the temptation. It's like y'all fish, right? Yeah, kind of. Or you hunt. You, put, you go into a deer stand. You put corn out. Or, you know, you, you go fishing, you put a lure, bait on the line. What, what are you trying to do? You're trying to tempt that fish to eat that, to take that bait. You know, you're trying to get the deer to come in so you can get a good shot at it. That's a temptation. Now, the ones that fall to temptation end up on your table, right? And the ones that don't, don't end up on your table. Well, Jesus, after he was beginning his ministry, went out into a wilderness, out, we say, the bush. And he was out there 40 days, 40 nights. And then Satan came to tempt him. The first time he said, Hey, Jesus, now, we don't know what form uh, Satan came to him in. He might have been, he might have looked like a religious hermit. He might have looked like some guy passing through. Whatever he looked like, he did not look threatening. But he was kind of there. He wanted to sympathize with Jesus. So you poor guy, he been out here 40 days, 40 nights. No food, no water, whatever. You, you're suffering. So he walked up, Satan said, hey, you know, you're son of God. See that rock right there? Why don't you turn that into a loaf of bread? Probably add some butter on the side, you know, and just go ahead and eat it. And Jesus, he said, now wait a minute. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Satan was trying to tempt him. Then the second time, he took him up, however he did that, he transported him up onto the top of the temple. And Satan said, hey, you know what? You know, why don't you just jump off of here? And this is what Satan did. He said, because. Because he saw where Jesus was coming from. He used God's word for the first strike. So for the second time, Satan said, hey, because you know God's word says that if you jump, the angels will protect you, won't even let your heel be bruised. And as, you know, you, will, you won't hit the ground that hard. And basically Jesus came back at him and said, you don't tempt God. You don't tempt him in any way. And then, final, Satan took him up somehow where he could see the panorama of the world. And he said, hey, Jesus, all of, if you just bow down to me and worship me, it's all yours. It's all yours. Now, I was wondering about that because it was already Jesus's. You know, it already belonged to him. I, I thought, Satan, did you just kind of have a slip up there? Yeah. But I guess he was thinking on the prince of the power of the air, prince of this world. You know, hey Jesus, you bow down to me, worship me. It's all yours. And Jesus came back and said, you only worship the Lord God and Him alone. Three times Jesus came back at him with boom, boom, boom. The word of God. And so, we have to be aware as Satan tempts us in many ways, angel of light or other ways, he tempts us. We need to say no and rely on God's word to get us through that. Let's bow our heads, please. As we've said, Satan is our greatest enemy, Jesus our greatest friend, because he died for us on the cross. If you be said that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, why don't you thank him for doing that for you, for, for giving his life, and for giving you the ability to fight against Satan. And if you not, it's what Jesus has done for us. You just say, Jesus, I know that there's no way I can get to 
heaven by myself. No way. But you've done everything for me. I want to thank you for that. And I ask you, I'm asking you in faith. I believe that you died for me, you were buried, and you rose for me. And I I believe that I'm accepting you right now as my Savior and my Lord. And I thank you for the gift of salvation that you give me, to bring me back in that right relationship with God, but also, as you say, to give eternal life. So thank you for that. And as a simple prayer, you can pray it any way you like along those lines and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Thank you for listening. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Help us to be aware of our enemy, our adversary, and to always watch for him. And then that we can use your word to say no and to repel his attacks and to resist him. And as you said in your word, if we resist Satan, Peter told us, then Satan will flee. He will run away because we're resisting not on our strength, but in your strength and in your word. In Jesus' name I pray.